another grinded out game in which because we were so good defensively we could win these grinded out games we weren't afraid of low scoring games and so um, we wore them down it was back and forth but um, you know we got better players we we win those and we did Nelsi was always the team to beat uh, we had already beaten them uh, so when we played them in, in districts you know three times as a charm and we did it
inter district play, certainly we were the favorites, but there's also no question that most of us on the team uh, played a little bit tight, you know, with those expectations, and I think that's normal. Um, I know my brother's team, they ended up winning the state title, but they had a difficult time getting out of their districts as well. So, you know, we went into overtime with Chesanine in that regular season game that clinched the conference title outright. And as we played them in district action, once again, they played with confidence as they should have, and we played tight. Uh, but again, we pulled it out. That was the most important thing. Crazy on the Chesanine stuff. I mean, they were had a terrible record, I believe, and two of the three times that they played right with us, uh, the one, the championship game, and then this one, um, we we figured out how to how to get it done there too, and being able to get to the district final was a big goal of ours. So um, at the end of the day, we we did what we had to do.
if there was any game we played to our competition, I think it would, would have been the Montrose game. Because typically when we would play a, a team that was new to us, we would come out and, and play lights out or at least play more relaxed. And I'm just not sure what happened in that game. I think because of the fact that we knew that this was for all the marbles in district is probably why we came out a little tight. But really, we were much, much better than what that final score indicated. And uh, But we just played, if there was a game we played down to our competition, it certainly would have been that one. We beat Montrose, and I don't want to say much more other than I ran into the head coach of that basketball team this last summer, last June. And I said, you were the basketball coach at Montrose. And I introduced myself, and he says, yeah, I remember that. You guys beat us in that district game. And, I mean, Montrose, who the heck was Montrose? It was a really special win, Montrose. I mean, we had never played Montrose before. And, I mean, Montrose, who the heck was Montrose? It was a really special win, Montrose. We really didn't have the best game. Uh, we weren't the best versions of ourselves that game, uh, but we still ended up getting by. And uh, it was a pretty special district, uh, you know, championship in our own gym. Montrose was weird because we had never played Montrose. Um, I think they had an average record, too. Uh, they had one guy who I ended up being friends with for a long time, Scott Taylor, who was um, one of their better players, and then Ricky Player and Jimmy Hodge. But uh, that was, that was like walk it up and shoot a brick, walk it up and shoot a brick. I mean, again, we played, we, we had the ability to play down to our competition. And we sure did there. And I think we were ahead the whole game or most of the game, but never by too much to where we could relax. Uh, just, just ugliness. But it's our first district championship. Everybody's excited. We had a full house there too, is that Corona? And uh, it was great to win another trophy. I mean, Montrose, who the heck was Montrose? That, that was a really, really cool day. I mean, we traveled a long way to get to the regional game, and it was obviously a, a Tuesday night or something like that. And I remember two games were going on, and I remember walking into that gymnasium, and it was a very big gymnasium, and definitely had butterflies. Uh, really excited that we were there. There was a you know a couple fan buses. Uh, it was a, we we had a great turnout, and it was so exciting uh, to go into that game. Heading into the regional game, I remember standing as a team huddled up uh, on the court before practice one day, and Charlie Carr came over and was talking to us, along with Coach Davis, telling us the scouting report of Eisenhower and how they had the big upset over Saginaw Bonavista, and they were mentioning how quick the Eisenhower guards were, this Tony Jessa. And Frank looks at the team and says, hey guys, this is icing on the cake. And I believe that his heart was in the right place, and I think he was trying. I think he could sense that we played a little bit tight during district action. So I really don't have a major problem with that approach. However, it sort of gave our team the impression that, hey, you know, I don't really expect to win anymore, but if we do, it's icing on the cake. So I can see that perspective as well, instead of taking the attitude of, hey, guys, let's go get it. I felt pretty confident. I know my my ankle, my foot was feeling better. Um, and I just felt good about that game going in. Heading into the regional game, we, we had a couple different mindsets. Um, you know, Coach Davis was very excited for what we had accomplished, and rightfully so. We had won the first conference championship, first district championship in 20 years, whatever it was. Um, so it's a place that Crown has never been before, at least in our lifetime. So we, we didn't know what to expect. I think that uh, some of us felt like we could do some damage, and some of us maybe didn't feel like we could do some damage. Some of us were okay with whatever was going to happen. And that's okay too, but um, we, we, we needed to be tough because we were playing a, a tough-minded team for sure. Carry on my wayward 
concern. There'll be peace when you are done. Lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. Yeah. 
game against Eisenhower is a little bit of a blur to me for some reason. I remember the incredible crowd noise and I remember the excitement. I personally, as a guard on the team, I played a little bit uptight. Uh, I was never counted on to score a whole lot, but uh, you know, I, I played good solid defense, but I absolutely remember that in the first part of that game we came out on fire, specifically Phil and East, and uh, every time he scored the crowd just went crazy. And I really felt at that point in the game, wow, we're going to do this. We're going to win this game. But then it just seemed like the game slowed down as they were dragging the ball inside to their guys who were sort of played like Phil Zielinski. Not as good as Phil Zielinski, but they had some pretty good hops uh, and, and they were fairly strong on the inside and they just they had some pretty good depth. Uh, they had several guys that were like 6'4 that really crashed the boards hard and they ended up getting our big guys in foul trouble and I just remember just methodically they came back two here a three-point there a three-point play here and there and before you know it they were right with us and it just seemed like all the momentum went to them and so you know, for us to start off the game as well as we did and then to see that momentum slip away, we could just not come back. And of course the fouls were starting to add up. And so you add it all up and it was a perfect recipe for us to lose down the stretch and, and that's what happened. And of course the score is not indicative of how close that game was because they tacked on at least 10 extra points at the end of the game with free throws uh, as we were forced to foul them. But it was really quite a devastating way to, to end the season, knowing how successful we were in the first half. And then it was even more disappointing, in a sense, to learn how far they ended up advancing after they beat us. To this day, I'm upset. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I really feel like we should have won the game. If I recall, we were up at like 12 at halftime, maybe more. I just know that they end up in the state finals. You know, I'm still pissed off because we should have been in the state finals. And I feel that way, even though it's been like 40 years. But I just really feel that way. I think we had that good a team. And we had the other kind of upsets going on that we, we could have been there. But, you know, I can't change history now. <laughs> You know, we were in that game, and, and I don't think we had our best game as a team. We had a couple guys that just stepped up like they always uh, do. You know, Phil and East being one of those guys, uh, he had a great game in that game. Uh, but um, we, we fell short, and it, 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 it hurt. After losing to Eisenhower, um, and then we watched their run to the title game, it just, it just didn't sit well. It sickens me to this day, knowing the fact that we had them down 15 at half. Should have beat them. If we play them today, we would beat them. Um, and they go to a title game, it just doesn't sit well. Um, 40 years later, still doesn't sit well. The Eisenhower game was really exciting too because we were playing in Bay City. There, it was right down the road from Salem. They had a huge crowd. We brought a lot of people. I still remember pregame warm ups are. Our warm-ups, or everybody was like buzzing because we looked like bees. We had some crazy-looking warm-ups on, um, but I remember the start of the game. It was loud. We couldn't hear anything, and we put it to them pretty pretty early, and uh, we had them. Um, it, it was really an exciting contest. At the end of the game, uh, we led through three quarters. We were ahead by as many as 15 points and uh, I just think our uh, inexperience of being in that situation kind of hurt us. I think we we let the the pressure of the situation get to us and Jeff and I ended up falling out. It kind of got away from us but the score is definitely not indicative of how close the game was. It was for most of the game we were either ahead or Tied, and so I think they finally went ahead midway through the fourth quarter and then got away from us at the end. But, you know, in retrospect, it was such a, a, a great season. Uh, we just felt like after watching everything play out that things could have been different for us uh, after that game or during that game.
You know, a story I've shared with a few of my teammates since we graduated that they have no recollection of this event, which I'm really shocked, but I am going to get it out there, is that one game, and I definitely believe it was our senior season, uh, he ended up playing Kenny Rogers, the gambler, in the locker room. And I don't believe it was at halftime. I think it was before the game. So he says, hey, guys, I want to share something with you. And so he, we're sitting there, and he pulls out his little uh, stereo player and plays Kenny Rogers, the gambler. And then uh, I think it was before he played the song, he said, hey, guys, we have to know when to run, and we have to know when to hold them. And referring to how we should probably transition from offense to defense. And then he played this song with that Frank Davis grin on his face. And uh, to me, that was a funny memory. But a few of the guys I talked to have zero memory of that. So maybe that was something I had a dream of. I have no idea. You got to know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. You never count your money When you're sitting at the table There'll be time enough for counting When the deal is done Frank Davis was probably one of the best best three men that I know besides my dad. Um, there was a fourth grade teacher, John Paradise, who made an impact on my life. Um, Frank Davis is another one who made an impact on my life. Um, in the classroom as well. Not a, I wasn't a good student. Never has been, probably never will be a good student. Um, but Frank took the time uh, to talk to me, to tutor me, um, to encourage me. Um, and to this day, um, I think he's more of a friend than he ever realized that he was. Mishler was their, but Chesney's best football player. They were crappy too, and it it just was. Mishler was talking a lot of crap to Pete, so he went in for a layup, and I remember Pete just took him all the way into the wall. The kid got up and pushed Pete, and Pete beat the crap out of him. He broke his glasses. The kid had glasses, smashed it all up, and he was all bloodied up, and it just. It was, it was insane. It was, it was a bigger, way bigger fight than the Haslam fight. I don't know why the hell I'm involved in a 1980 video. Oh yeah, I guess I do. Phil Anise brought up one of his memories was uh, a game I was involved in back my senior year in basketball. I guess it was quite memorable because it led to an all-out brawl. Fans got in the action. To set the stage a little bit, we were beating Hazlitt. And this kid that I was covering, his name was Steve Wren, and about three times in a row down the court, he would give me an elbow. And he was hitting me kind of in the, in the ribs, in the you know, upper arm. Well, the last time, he elbowed me right in the nose. And you know what that's like. So I had a little bit of a temper, too. And we were beating them late in the game. Referees were Bill Renwick and Gary Schooley, so we had the home cooking. So he hit me with the elbow, and I flat out punched him right in the face, and then all hell broke loose. There was people pushing me over to the side where the stands were in the old Corona gym. Jack McCoy's dad was grabbing somebody. There was another lady that was hitting somebody with an umbrella. It was all hell broke loose. Uh, Schooley and Renwick called the game. We officially got the W, beating Hazlitt. I do remember there was a couple guys in the Oh, I know what it was. Ernie Snook, our coach, that great coach we had, he made sure Mike Valasek didn't get into the middle of the fracas. He wanted to protect his star player, but some of the guys like Randy Tremere, Mike Lezovich, they came out there and were laying some haymakers. So it was quite memorable. It wasn't part of 1980, but I will say this. You guys had a great team and really set the foundation for Crown uh, becoming a basketball school for quite a while. I remember practicing against them, and they were good. Um, you know, they weren't varsity caliber, obviously, but they were good. I also remember Zelinski 
because I remember him boxing me out, and I'm going, holy cow, I got kids that, uh, varsity kids that don't box me out like that. The scrimmage. Uh, I always hear about the scrimmage. My memory of it fades, uh, I, I don't know. I hear a lot of different stories about it, who won, what was going on, but I do remember it, and I don't know. I can't remember a lot of the guard play and stuff, but if, if, if Anise was there, I'm sure he was jawing the whole time. But I think the toughest part of the scrimmage for me was playing against Rowley, and I think I spent the whole thing, the whole scrimmage, just trying to keep him from elbowing my face. I remember you guys were strong, and you know we were freshmen, and that's really what I remember. I don't I don't know who won. I just remember it was a tough scrimmage, and, and that's about my memory of it. But, boy, there's a lot of things about your team I remember. It was our introduction to Corona basketball, and the, the final game was something else to watch. And I remember Anise lighting it up, and I remember how aggressive you guys were with Eisenhower's duo of guards. I don't even care what Eisenhower did after that. It was something to see. And... You know, you never know where your, your team was going to be or how they were going to play in the future or my career. But when I saw that game, I said to myself, I want that. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, trying to uh, remember some of the things about the 1983 team. A lot of it was, was easy to remember when they were seniors, but when they were freshmen, they were a really good uh, team for our area at least and, and they were undefeated and um, very had a lot of confidence and of course John Patel was the kind of ringleader so to speak he he after being undefeated he of course was checking all the papers and see what every other freshman team in the area was like and Flint Beecher was undefeated also at that time and he wanted to he was convinced we should play Flint Beecher because uh, we should beat Flint Beecher so we'd be the best team, you know, in the area. And I think he even tried to get uh, whoever was the AD then. I can't remember if it was Duff or, or who, was, uh, who was the AD in, in uh, 80. But anyway, he, uh, he was – and John was also in charge, I think, of how they went on to the floor. Uh, with all the shenanigans they did, running around two groups, running around the, on each side of the, or around the floor in opposite directions, and knocking hands or whatever, whatever the thing was going to be. And that, the whole group was very confident like that, you know, Phil and, and Jimmy and Rich. And, uh, and, and you got to remember, too, that we had uh, Rob Nurse at that time, too. And when it came to cockiness, he was just, he was, almost at the top of the ring too so um, all those guys had a just had had something like that something special that they just um, they didn't think they could be beat as a group I, I think they all thought they were, had some talent but they just all felt that uh, together as a group they couldn't be beat and um, you know they, they they were talented they were they were cocky but they were talented they backed up most of what they what they said, and uh, the biggest problem with them was keeping them, you know, in the lower stratosphere. They were they were so high of uh, playing, you know, they were playing good basketball, and they thought they could beat anybody. I think if you if you told them they could schedule the Pistons, they probably would would mark it on their calendar. That would be what they wanted to do. So it was just, you know, the whole group, and and. Uh, you know, I can name all those guys. They just, they were, they were great players. I, I don't think, I was trying to think if, uh, uh, Brian, cause, or, uh, Oskowski was there then, but I don't think he was, as a freshman, was there. I think he came in, uh, later, but, um, yeah, great, great bunch of kids, great, great confidence, and of course they, they, they were ready to take on the varsity. They, they thought they were varsity material, even as freshmen. So uh, that's kind of what led into the, to the scrimmage. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's just, just the way that group was. My memory of scrimmaging against the 83 team was that uh, Charlie Carr came over and talked to Davis, and Davis had that little smirk of his, and he said, hey, guys, um, 
you know, the freshman team, they want to scrimmage us. And I believe that they scrimmaged our second team at first. And it's not like they dominated them, but they definitely, I think if they put a scoreboard up, I think they won, if I'm not mistaken. And so I believe we were, you know, saying to Frank, Coach Davis, come on, come on, come on. Let us play against these guys. And certainly, there's no question that we, again, if they threw a scoreboard up, there's no doubt that we beat them and beat them quite handily. But my takeaway from the scrimmage at that time, and of course now you have the, uh, you have the ability to look back in hindsight, see the fact that they were a state championship caliber team as well, uh, that, that they definitely fared quite well considering that they were freshmen playing against not just a varsity team, but a very, very... Uh, a very good varsity. Okay, uh, and as far as what I remember about the AD team, and I and uh, it, it was a very very good team, and uh, had had good guards, and, and of course had uh, Rowley underneath, and he was a he was a good player at that point, really good defensive player, and long, and and uh, he had to he had to shore up the defense a little bit for them, and on, in the inside, and of course they had Phil Nice and. Uh, Phil and I kind of we kind of jab at each other a little bit. We we always played in um, open rec and would always try to get on each other's team and and we'd always argue about who was the best shooter and I'd always tell him that he was the second best shooter I ever knew besides myself and he would say about the same thing to me. But uh, just it was a great group of guys too. A great great uh, great group to have fun with and and still and and. Uh, I enjoyed him a lot. I have a simple memory of Coach Davis saying, hey, we got this great group of freshmen. We're going to bring them up. We're going to let them play against you guys. Well, against you guys was our second group. And I remember this clearest day in my foggy memory that we weren't, the first team were not did not scrimmage them. That was not the intent. They were going to play our second group, and that's what they did. And they they handled our second group pretty well. They did well against our second group. Um, I don't know if I could say they beat our second group, but they played with our second group. And I think a couple of us told Davis, because they uh, we could see the little guys getting a little cocky, I think a couple of us, I know one of them was me, said, put our asses in there against them. And from what I remember, when we went in the first group against them, they didn't get the ball over half court. They looked like Durant against us. So Johnny, I'm sure, has a different memory, but that's the right memory. So I remember we uh, had the opportunity to scrimmage you guys when we were freshmen. You know, we thought we were pretty good. Uh, and obviously we knew you guys were good. Um, but we were pretty pumped up about it, and my recollection of the scrimmage is we, we certainly didn't win, but I felt that we held our own. So we were able to bring the ball up the court, we were able to get shots off. Um, I remember uh, specifically from where I, where I sat, um, I remember taking a jump shot from the corner, and I swear to God Jeff Rowley was underneath the basket, and he... He was able to, to come out and swat it into the into one of the side courts, um, but again, I felt that we it, it was good for us because we didn't just get whitewashed. Like you would think a, a varsity team as good as yours playing against a freshman team. I mean, why are they? Why are we even scrimmaging each other? Quite honestly, um, but I know that we badgered Coach Carr that we wanted to play a, we wanted to play a, we wanted to play a. And I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, if we played in a game that you guys would have won, and I'm sure you won that scrimmage. But again, from our standpoint, we felt like we held our own. Um, we didn't get embarrassed. And we felt we did better than our JV team did. I remember the bus rides because weren't the cheerleaders with us? And so we had a lot of friends, the cheerleaders, and it was like, who could who could sit closest to the cheerleaders? I know George and Jimmy were always uh, the most social with the cheerleaders, so the rest of us acted stupid. 
trying to get to Bullet Creek, he might as well take a canoe up a creek. And, uh, you know, in Elma, I remember going to Elma. Of course, this year we got a lot of snow, but I remember going by Elma a few times. Man, that might have been in our senior year where they had the big snowstorm. I think that was the storm of 78, and all the trees were snapped off on the expressway between Ithaca and Elma. But it was, uh, those are a couple trips I remember. You know, the bus rides were, I mean, just the camaraderie and the bus rides were pretty cool. I mean, it was just like a weenus, and plus you even had cheerleaders on the bus ride, and that was kind of fun, too. The bus ride in particular, when I was a young lad, I think I was in fifth or sixth grade, and I was uh, helping with a football team as a water boy, and when we traveled up towards Elma, we stopped at this local A&W uh, root beer stand. It might even have been uh, a baseball a double header up there, but we stopped at A&W to eat, and I ended up sitting in there as the water boy with uh, bus ride bus driver Don Butcher, and I remember even as a kid I could smell embellishment a mile away, but he sat there and told me story after story. Well, when I was in high school, I averaged 30 points a game. Well, when I ran the football, most of the time when I got my hands on it, I scored a touchdown. The handheld games had just recently come out, and uh, so I remember some of the guys that grew up with a little bit of money, um, they would be, you know, we'd be a little bit envious that they would be playing their little electronic games on the bus ride, and every once in a while they would share the game with some other players, um, and so I remember that. The bus rides were fun to me because there was a lot of camaraderie. I mean, you spend a lot of time with these fellow athletes, and the bus ride was no different. You were traveling from one, one place to another, but you were joking around and sharing stories. And I remember starting with my junior year, a lot of the basketball players on the team, some of the uh, guys ended up receiving gifts for Christmas, the electronic games, uh, the Game Boys or whatever they were called, and they would pass it around the bus to different athletes. One day during practice, um, Austin, for some reason I'm drawing a blank on his first name, uh, who was, uh, when I, this is when I was a junior, uh, he said, hey guys, you gotta come into the bathroom and see this. And he goes, I just laid the biggest turd. <laughs> now, only guys would be interested in, in actually running into the bathroom and, and taking a look at this momentous event. But, I don't know, there was probably three or four of us that went running in there. And uh, I will admit, it was quite astounding. It was like a Dairy Queen ice cream, uh, the soft serve. It went around the bowl about a time and a half or two times. We would run fire drills all the time. And, man, they would, they would wear you out. I remember fire drills. Uh, but they got us in condition. And, and then I also remember... Uh, Coach Davis's jump shot. I mean, he would. We would all be kind of around the basket, and I thought it was pretty cool because he had a pretty good shot uh, to see an old guy be able to shoot the basketball. Getting a couple fist fights with my own brother in practices. I remember the Anises, so that wouldn't be my senior year. But I remember Tony and Phil squaring off a couple of times. Um, you know, the other thing I remember, I felt we ran a lot. You know, and we needed to because we played pretty darn good defense. And we were in that zone, and you had to move your feet to cover places. And we ran a lot. I remember Scotty Robertson bringing out those wrestlers doing line drills with us, and I'm going, wow. I guess this isn't too bad if the wrestlers can do this pushing a towel. We had the basketball in our hands very often. We ran a lot, and we never won. And then... Um, our senior year, I remember irritating Coach Davis so much when um, when I was hurt. He used to get so mad at me because we had all the free throw drills that we would do and stuff, and I'd go out there and stand on one leg and make free throws, and and so he would try and make me run when I could get a tennis shoe on. So I ended up running around the gym more times than I actually got to practice. Of course, when you think of practice, you always think of running. And in basketball, you had the uh, the line drills, which were, you know, murderous. Uh, you're not doing as much running when you're in football. And then when you enter basketball, it's nothing but running. So outside of that, just a few memories I have. I remember Phil and East getting in a, 
in a bitch slap contest with uh, with uh, Peterson, and of course Peterson lost the battle. My favorite gyms, uh, I can tell you the gym I couldn't stand playing in, and I scored a lot there was St. John's. It always felt like there was a light out or something. It was blinking. <laughs> I just, I just, <laughs> I just felt like uh, St. John's, I, I know I had 30 against them uh, my junior year, but um, I just didn't like playing there. But I, honestly, I can't say, I, oh, I liked playing at any gym other than Corona. Corona High School gym. It was so new and so fresh and uh, so large. Uh, it just felt at home in our own gym. We had the new gym. Of course, I always hear people complain about the lights were sort of a yellowish and a little dull, but it had so much space. As a younger athlete, as a freshman and as a sophomore, I always played well at Ovid Elsey, so I, I personally liked that gym as well. There's no question that I enjoyed the Corona gym. Uh, the fact that it had so much room uh, on, on both the sidelines and under the baskets um, and it was very, very nice to see us fill up our side of the bleacher. I think as the 1980 season went on, um, the, the fans got a little bit more into it. And I think even the, the fan base, even the students realized that we had something special going on that year with what we were doing uh, and how we were doing it. And there was nothing, um, no egotistical type things going on in our team. Um, but everybody knew who, the good thing about us is everybody knew what their roles were. Everybody had a role. Fans were un unbelievable. I mean, it, it's, we started to have some of that football feel happen on the, in the basketball stands. I mean, the pep band, I remember vividly. And as I've gotten older, that's what I miss at basketball games, is pep bands. And uh, I mean, it, it was, there's nothing like it. There's many people in our society that think that athletes probably receive too much credit, and there could be some merit to that. But I can tell you that as a kid growing up uh, playing varsity sports, uh, football, basketball, baseball, uh, there's nothing better than the confidence that you receive from having your fellow uh, classmates at school recognize you or your team. And during our basketball season, I remember, it seems like before the big games, the cheerleaders would put a note on your locker, you know, some silly thing like, you know, fire up Cavaliers. I remember as I worked at Dom's 5 and 10 store in downtown Corona, that uh, even many adult citizens would come in and, uh, you know, pat me on the back for the win uh, the night before and um, would, you know, enthusiastically talk to me about the basketball team. So. You know, those memories are, are very, very special and can't be replaced. I think one of the special feelings that I have, and, and I still have dreams about it, it would be when we would be ready to go out onto the court before a game, before a home game. We'd be congregated there in the, uh, in the, in the side of the bleachers by our locker room waiting to go out on the court, waiting for the JV game to be done. And we'd be in those bumblebee uh, warm-ups uh, where we looked like a bunch of bumblebees, uh, but it was so exciting to then go out on court and hear the music, and it was just, I, it was awesome. I remember our, it was the first time going to Corona Games and now playing in Corona Games where we consistently packed that big gym. The seating, the capacity was quite large for a Class B high school, and by mid-season we were packing it in, and you know you got a lot of the adults who had played at Corona previously that were really into it, and uh, it was it was pretty cool to go through that experience. There was an unbelievable energy that just continued to occur. Um, I mean, my parents, my 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 brother, um, his buddy. Uh, my employer, Mr. Beeler, Chris Printing. I mean, everybody was into Corona basketball and it was just so special. Finally, we had crowds there. We had a big gym and to have that thing packed because we finally had a good basketball team. Um, 
you know, I feel proud about that, having a team that the community could feel good about. Jack and Diane painted a picture of my life and my dreams Suddenly this crazy world made more sense to me Well I heard it today and I couldn't help but sing along Cause every time I hear that song And I go back to a two-tone short bed Chevy Driving my first love out to the levee Living life with no sense of time of a 50 yard line, a blanket, a girl, some raspberry wine. The wishing time would stop right in its tracks. Every time I hear that song, I'll go back. I'll go back. I used to rock all night long to keep on rocking. Me, baby, at frat parties, college bars, just trying to impress the ladies. Well, I heard it today and I couldn't help but sing along. Cause every time I hear that song, and I go back to the smell of a no gym floor and the taste of salt on a Carolina shore after graduation and drinking goodbye to friends. I go back to watch a summer fade to fall Growing up too fast and I do recall Wishing time would stop right in its tracks Every time I hear that song Somehow stamped our lives Takes us to another place and time So I go back to the pew Preacher and a choir Singing about God of brimstone and fire And the smell of Sunday chicken after church And I go back to the loss of a real good friend And the 16 summers I shared with him Now only the good die young Stops me in my tracks Every time I hear that song I'll go back I'll go back To the field of a 50 yard line A blanket of girls, some raspberry wine
And when George called me about doing this interview, I was at a friend's house. We were looking something up on YouTube. I said, you know, I'm still pissed off because we should have been in the state finals, and I feel that way even though it's been like 40 <laughs> years. I fouled out in the third quarter. I had six points. Probably had zero rebounds. We just were not very good. We just weren't a very good team. I, I remember driving in for a layup, and I kicked the ball, and it hit the wall and came back and hit me in the face. I mean, I could not that punch it. Very, very special time Friday night. Like, Went just eight we were everybody's cupcake is what I remember. You know, cookies for us after the game, which again, why why we remember certain things, I don't know, but do you guys remember? The only words I gave could us ever cookies? understand in that huddle over there was motherfucker and then a whole lot of some other stuff. But I didn't go to English class like for a whole year and got in trouble. I remember Jim. I remember him always slapping, and he always was one of those irritants. No, no, never, Mr. George. Never. I remember Phil, you know. The only weakness that Phil and East had was humility. I was uh, in humility. high school, I averaged 30 points a game. Well, when I ran the football, most of the time when I got my hands on it, I scored a touchdown. George was unbelievable. George? to shoot the old two-handed set shot. Very smart, but a, a, a different kind of person. Do you want to tell us on camera why you're jealous that I was Big Man? <laughs> <laughs> George was Big Man. Was always available to us. And speaking of Vietnam, I think I'm getting bombed. Very, very special Friday night. I remember that vividly. No memories. No, memory. no memories, George. <laughs> we were all devastated to know that Phil was not able to participate uh, with the team early in the season based this on might his sound football crazy, injury. But I love football. <laughs> I love football. The uh, only positive about that you know. is that there would be more points for everybody else on the team to get. <laughs> interview I was at a friend's house we were looking something up on YouTube <laughs> uh, and I said you know I'm still pissed off because we should have been in the state finals and I feel that way even though it's been like 40 years <laughs>